Okay. So our recording is going. We should be all set. My name is uh, Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I coordinate the Forest Connect Forestry Extension Program for Cornell University. I'm joined today by Steve Gabriel, who is a forest farmer and extension aide. He's a forest farmer in private practice and extension aid with, aid with Cornell University Cooperative Extension. He's going to be talking about production of gourmet mushrooms and mushroom cultivation. Before we get started with that, let me give a little bit of, uh, of an orientation to everyone here. Just this is still a new software system for a lot of people. So one thing I'll do is I'll repost in the chat pod for those of you who are interested in continuing education credits you can click on that link that'll take you to a, uh, a secure Cornell web page where you enter your email address and name and I can document you as participating so that you'll receive a continuing education credit documentation certificate of sorts so that's one thing to pay attention to um, a second feature here is that if you go to the upper left hand corner and click on the file menu and go down to save as actually I think either save or save as will work and then select document you will be uh, allowed to save to your computer a PDF version or a UCF version of this presentation. So if you want to see a, a copy of these of these slides as a handout, you can do that save as feature. And I would encourage you to go ahead and do that now. You can delete it later if you don't want it, um, but then you don't have to worry about finding that. I, I post a copy of a PDF of this presentation onto the Forest Connect Ning site. It's a website that all of you will be um, shown when you close out of this session, so you don't need to worry about that web address. Um, but for those of you that are here live and want to see this, this that's a, a good tool. Uh, you can take advantage of that. Another thing to take advantage of is that you can uh, um, adjust the size of the presentation on your monitor. If, if you look in the lower left-hand corner, you have a couple of options. Uh, you have a percentage uh, drop-down menu, and you, then you have a zoom in and zoom out um, uh, icon that allows you to change the size of the, of the image on your screen. And then, of course, you have the option to ask questions. So if you have questions for uh, Steve as he's presenting, please go ahead and type those into the chat pod. Uh, Steve's going to try to keep track of those as, as we go through the presentation, but if not, we have the option of of scrolling backwards. So your, your question will not be lost, um, and it will allow you to um, record that, and then Steve can, uh, Steve can give a verbal response to your written question. So with that as an as a orientation, um, and I, I guess I'm obligated to let you all know that this is being recorded, so um, this will show up on the internet later on. Uh, with that, I'm happy and pleased to introduce Steve Gabriel. Um, Steve is a colleague in Cornell University Cooperative Extension and a, a forest farmer practitioner in the central New York Finger Lakes area, and he's had has a great deal of experience in um, how to cultivate gourmet mushrooms in forest-grown settings. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Steve, and I'm going to mute my microphone and just kind of hover in the background and learn more about this process. Steve, welcome, and the floor is yours. All right, great. Thanks, Ken, and uh, thanks to all of you. Great to see a good turnout uh, participating today. I have a little bit of a head cold. I think I've spent maybe a few too many... Uh, these rainy afternoons out in our on our farm, so it's kind of starting to catch up. But I'm gonna do my best. To make sure let us know if there's any sound or other issues. But we'll uh, we'll keep going forward here. Um, my I've been growing uh, mushrooms uh, at various places uh, for the last six years, uh, and I'm fortunate now um, in uh, in the last year or so to start working with uh, Professor Ken Mudge at Cornell. 
and start to take some of my interest in the sort of field work of mushroom cultivation and bring it into some of our research settings. So we're very active in actually studying the different parameters that are going to be useful to, to mushroom growers. And we're pretty interested in supporting anyone that wants to grow mushrooms. A lot of our research is focused uh, directly on, on farm uh, cultivation. And we really believe that mushrooms and shiitake in particular have a really a bright future as a commercial crop. Um, so that's something we'll be really looking at in detail today. As, as Pete mentioned, um, feel free to post questions in the, uh, in the chat box and we'll try to answer them as we go. And um, my email is also sfg53 at cornell.edu. And so if you're listening in the evening and there's a good chance I, I will uh, not be live in the evening, you can always email me and, and feel free to ask as many mushroom questions as you want. There's certainly a lot of them. So we'll get going here. Uh, the first thing uh, to start sort of big picture is to highlight that the mushrooms are an agroforestry crop and uh, the USDA defines uh, different temperate agroforestry uh, practices. Um, <clears throat> the five that you see here with the sort of similar drawing are the five that the USDA has identified. So we have forest farming, which is the cultivation of crops underneath the canopy of an existing forest. We have alley cropping, which is bringing tree crops into uh, row agriculture or tillage agriculture. Um, so something like down in the southern states, sometimes we see uh, black walnut plantations uh, and growing annual crops uh, in between those. Uh, we have uh, riparian buffers um, as an agroforestry practice, which is uh, essentially doing stream bed uh, support plantings, uh, improving or, or conserving uh, stream resources, or river resources. Uh, we have windbreaks, which are pretty self-explanatory plantings that are looking to uh, mitigate the effects of wind on landscapes. And the fifth one is silvopasture, which is mixing, it's really a three-layered system. We have the tree crops as a canopy, we have the grazing animals, and we have grasses. Uh, in silvopasture, we're actually, um, uh, you know, it, it, bringing the animals in and actually thinning out the forest to a heavy degree. We're looking at maybe a 40 or 50% or forest cover uh, in this situation. We have uh, a few people saying they're low volume. Peter, do we want to try to address anything? Uh, folks there, you may uh, want to increase your volume. Because mine's at the, as Peter said, at the maximum amount. So I'll keep going here. Um, the sixth sixth practice on this slide is is uh, is forest gardening and uh, you know Ken Mudge and I have sort of informally added this to uh, to, the, to the, the five other practices that are defined by the USDA and we've had some interesting feedback from uh, different agroforestry experts about this but forest gardening is a practice that has been gaining popularity um, uh, if you're familiar with permaculture as a discipline uh, forest farming is often associated with that and there was a book that came out in 2005 called Edible Forest Gardens. And that book, uh, you know, did a great job of, of describing basically um, uh, mimicking uh, forest structure and function when, when creating gardens. And so we're, we're starting with sort of open land or, or garden land and we're looking to uh, add different layers of vegetation and, and have a maybe upper tree canopy layer or a shrub layer or a herbaceous layer and really pack a lot in. And so um, it, it is really distinguishing from, uh, from forest farming, for example, in the sense that uh, forest gardening is, is mimicking these things and we're often packing a lot of species in and often starting with 100% light and adding plants as, uh, as opposed to forest farming where we're growing crops underneath an existing canopy. And usually we want that canopy to be almost as, as dense as, as we can. So we'll sort of zoom in further from that. So we have agroforestry. We have those those five or six practices, if you will. Um, we'll zoom in a little bit to forest farming because mushrooms really fit well into this category or, or best. Um, as I mentioned, forest farming is the cultivation of non-timber forest crops underneath the canopy of an existing forest. And we like to use the nomenclature that forest farming is productive conservation in the, in the idea that 
Uh, these crops give us an incentive to be able to manage existing forests and support their health uh, while getting various things out of that, that forest ecosystem, uh, expanding the palette from perhaps timber and, and, and firewood, for example. So, so lots of interesting potential here. Uh, we often focus on these categories of, of crops. So we have medicinal plants, uh, ginseng, golden seal are, are the most common that are produced on a commercial level. Uh, we have mushrooms, and which is really uh, the focus of this talk, uh, nut production. Um, at Cornell, we have the McDaniels Nut Grove, uh, which is um, is excellent, and it's a it's an existing hickory forest that a, a professor named Lawrence McDaniels um, was able to uh, was able to plant in the 20s, and is now a you know 80 year old existing uh, nut uh, grove, and so have a lot of interesting uh, cultivars and different things going on there. Also in that nut grove, we do produce uh, several small fruits. The one in the picture here is pawpaw. Uh, pawpaw is a native to the Appalachian uh, range, and so we get it all the way up into New York uh, and down into the southern states. Um, not so much naturalized or wild here uh, versus when I was you know, in Virginia, uh, would find thickets of it out in the woods. But pawpaw is a, a really nice fruit. And, uh, and can be cultivated rather well underneath uh, pretty dense shade in the forest. Uh, the final uh, crop area we focus on are ornamentals, and there's an emerging market for things like hostas, uh, ferns, whether they're edible or just ornamental. Um, and also in this picture, we have orchids. Uh, we've been doing research in the nut grove um, about different orchid uh, cultivation techniques. And, and if anyone's been looking for those or bought them in the past, you know there's pretty good uh, market value for those those crops. So the other thing to consider with non-timber forest products is we do have sort of two different uh, categories. Cultivation, uh, where we're actually intentionally bringing these species into the forest. Uh, there's also wild crafting. And so some of these species actually bridge both. Uh, an example that we'll talk about today is uh, heresium or lion's mane. Um, that can both be cultivated, but it can also be found in the wild. You can see the photo there on the right. That's uh, Paul Stamets, who is, uh, is a pretty well-known uh, mushroom uh, enthusiast. Uh, he's wrote several great books uh, about mushroom cultivation, and he's with one of our previous uh, Cornell grad students, and they found some, some lion's mane there on a tree. Um, below that is, is chicken of the woods, um, which is an excellent edible mushroom. Uh, pretty easy to identify as well. It's a good uh, beginner mushroom. Uh, that one's not well uh, established in any sort of sense of cultivation. It's really one that we continue to just find uh, as a wild crafting. Um, and then we have on the left, uh, under cultivation, the, the fellow there is, is looking at his ginseng patch. Ginseng is a crop that could be both cultivated and wild crafted, although we don't really recommend wild crafting because at this point the populations of wild ginseng are, are so decimated and so low that we're really going to have a detrimental effect on populations. Um, if we continue to rely on them for our, our crops. And, uh, and finally, you can see the dowels there at the bottom left. Uh, this is, in general, the way we, we cultivate mushrooms, which we'll, we'll dive into a little deeper here. Uh, let's look at sort of mushrooms as a forest farming crop. So we have two really common forest farming crops here in the slides. On the left is shiitake mushroom, which is cultivated on log bolts, uh, is what we call the logs. They're about three feet long four to six inches in diameter usually. And shiitake mushrooms currently are getting somewhere between 12 and $16 a pound on average. And that's a sort of direct market price. A little bit less for wholesale uh, and a little bit more sometimes in urban areas where these mushrooms are, are less common. Um, compare that to our, our ginseng on the right. Uh, cultivated American ginseng can uh, fetch two or $300 a pound. So quite a bit of difference there in profit per pound but the difference really is, and this is really key to, to forest farming, a lot of agroforestry uh, practices in general, is that when we sort of break it down further, we have uh, with our ginseng, while the yield may seem great and, and the price per pound pretty astronomical, um, we get eight years before we really have our first harvest of ginseng. And we get one you know, harvest a year, and after we've pulled out those roots and sold them, uh, we have to replant. We don't have uh, the same kind of longevity with our uh, with our ginseng versus our shiitake mushrooms. We're going to see uh, flushes of, of mushrooms in the, in the first year. Uh, so we, there's a one year, one growing season um, 
uh, waiting period, and then you get uh, usually two or three flushes a season for three or four years. Uh, we've seen some logs go even into five or six years. And so, you know, we get a, an interesting mix here um, of these different crops, and, uh, and the answer is not to choose one or the other, but if you're thinking about forest farming, to really get into some of both um, and look at some of these as short-term yields and, and long-term yields. But uh, the fact that we can get so much out of a, a, a log that we've inoculated, we can get four or five years of, of, uh, of good yields is, is a really compelling reason to think about mushroom cultivation. And then we can further drill down and think about the difference between log grown versus uh, the, the shiitake that you often find in the grocery store, which is uh, most often grown in compressed uh, blocks of either sawdust or, or grain. And there's some kind of nutrient uh, balance there or some kind of uh, nutrient additive. And those are grown indoors uh, in a climate controlled environment. And uh, so we we're talking about humidity and temperature control, you know, 24-7, seven, seven days a week kind of thing. Versus the shiitakes, which are were seasonal. We, we start to get our mushrooms coming out this time of year. Um, and they'll, they'll go through maybe October or so. Um, but you can see the stark contrast in quality. I mean, the log-grown mushrooms are just gorgeous. And their texture, their flavor profile um, is, is far surpasses the ones uh, that you see on the right there, which are the sort of store-bought ones. Um, we also have some evidence there's you know, some debate about nutritional qualities because it really depends, again, on these, these compressed sawdust, what's being added as far as nutrition goes. But we, are, we find uh, the nutrition value of the log-grown shiitake in many cases to be superior to that of the, of the sawdust-grown shiitake. Um, and we are finding that restaurants and, and farmers markets and, and even grocery stores are willing to sell the log-grown ones for, for that $16 a pound price on average uh, versus when you go to the store and get these, these sawdust-grown ones, you're usually getting about $6 a pound. So you know, significant uh, cost difference there in terms of, of your value at market. You know, the other piece about shiitake mushrooms in particular, um, and again, there's some evidence about sort of log-grown versus, versus uh, indoor cultivated, uh, is all these different and, and wonderful myriad of, of nutritional benefits um, where we look at um, sort of lowering of cholesterol as a, as a potential. We have um, lentinin, which is a, a, a polysaccharide that uh, contains sort of an anti-cancer property. There's been extensive research that's literally putting mycelium of, of shiitake uh, in, a, in a petri dish um, with, uh, with the cancer cells and, and having the, the mycelium really retard any cancer cell growth. Um, shiitake has this interesting quality where it sort of supports immune system balance, um, where it seems to help regulate uh, immune system per performance. So when you need a boost of your of your immune system, it tends to help provide that, and when you need it to sort of slow down, and uh, we tend to have good good effects there. And really good sources of vitamins. Um, we often encourage growers to to highlight the the nutritional value for vegetarians for shiitake mushrooms. Uh, really high protein, probably the best protein source um, as a replacement for meat uh, that you could find out there, um, and a really good source of things like magnesium and vitamin D. Uh, so these are all things that we talk about with growers to really promote, um, you know, the differences and, and, and really some of the benefits of eating these. Often people think that mushrooms are really fun to eat, they taste really good, they're really interesting, but they actually are a really valuable and an important food source uh, in terms of the nutritional value. So, you know, then we look into sort of, that's great from a consumer standpoint, you know, we have a, a highly nutritious, a really beautiful, a, a really well-tasting uh, mushroom. From a farmer standpoint, what's interesting about uh, particularly shiitake mushroom production is these different qualities. So we have a very low initial investment. Um, uh, Ken and I have been involved with some others at University of Vermont and Chatham University in a, in a project uh, where we have been working with about 25 growers around the Northeast. And what was nice about that is we had those growers inoculate 100 logs um, and keep data, keep records about the time they spent, the cost they incurred, um, pretty much all aspects of production, uh, including when they actually took them to the market, what they got for fair market value and for price. And what we found is on average, people were spending about three to five dollars per log uh, in cost. And this includes their labor to inoculate and maintain these logs over their lifetime. 
And at the, in that same lifetime, again, with shiitake, we're talking about three, four, five years, um, seen a really high return in terms of 50 or $60 uh, worth of mushrooms per log. And that's a really, I mean, that's a selling point right there for, for the farming community. To have that high of a return is pretty remarkable. Uh, we're also finding that people are having good success um, using uh, selling actually just inoculated logs to people to, to grow. And you can usually sell those for about $15 or $20 a pound, which is still a really good, good margin. Um, you know, another benefit from a farmer's standpoint is that often the forest uh, space on their, on their farm is uh, maybe a, a woodlot for timber or for firewood, but often not utilized for farm crops. And so we're often making use of otherwise unproductive space. Again, there's a high demand. You know, some of these markets in New York City uh, and Washington, D.C., we've been seeing uh, you know, $25 a pound fresh uh, for mushrooms. And um, it's certainly a niche crop. And when we think about niche crops, some of the different qualities there, one of the, the biggest being uh, that it really stands out. So if you're at farmer's market and, and you're alongside a number of other farmers and they have their, they have their kale and they have their tomatoes, they have their this and that, uh, shiitake mushrooms really draw in people. Uh, they're a very unique crop at this point, and it's a nice one to get into because there's actually the market's quite wide open. There's a lot of uh, demand, and there's not a lot of supply. We don't have a ton of growers. As far as thinking about the mushroom production and, and sort of the forestry aspect, um, this has been of particular interest uh, in my own experience. And um, when I actually got into shiitake production, it wasn't because I, I wanted to grow mushrooms. It was actually uh, back when I worked at a local nature center, and we were conducting a, a timber stand improvement for our, our sugar bush. Uh, we produced maple syrup, and we had all these, these small diameter logs left over, and I, I was uh, compelled to think about, well, there's got to be some other use, something other that we could put these logs into other than just burning them for firewood. I mean, we can certainly do that, and there's value. But maybe there's something else we can look at. And um, that was when we, we come, came across a, a local farmer who was growing shiitake. He, gave, he came to the Nature Center and, uh, and gave a workshop. And from the, you know, the first harvest I had, I was pretty hooked. And I, I really liked the, the idea that uh, some of the undesirable tree species that we might be seeking in our forest ecosystem, we could actually uh, turn them into really valuable uh, outputs. Uh, and it really provided an incentive for me um, to start thinking about conducting more timber stand improvements. You know, we, we can sometimes find federal funding like EQIP through the NRCS uh, or some other ways to uh, justify a timber stand improvement, which is in general thinning out younger aged and, and lower value wood um, with an eye toward the future, with an eye towards our, our timber down the line. You know, so this really provides a, a reasonable incentive for us to get out and do those things early. The second thing is sugar maple certainly as a timber species is desirable on its own, so we can think about thinning it out as a, as a product for, for mushroom production. But you know, another thing is just simply thinking of things to do with undesirable tree species uh, that don't have a timber value or a long-lasting value. And so beech is one that often uh, woodlot owners are looking to thin out of their woodlot. Uh, don't really have a, a, a use or a purpose. It's certainly a, a decent firewood. There's some, you know, woodworking value in it, but not necessarily an easy, uh, an easy outlet. So uh, beech has been something we've been working with, and we found that shiitake mushrooms as well as lion's mane work really well on beech. Um, you know, again, low-value woods, uh, thinning out poplars and cottonwoods, things like that. We can grow oyster mushrooms on those, and so it provides an incentive for us to take out those trees that you know, even at a very large diameter may not have uh, as much a, an interest in terms of their marketability. And like I said, a sort of general byproduct of, of TSI or, or timber stand improvement. So, you know, we can really do uh, quite a bit of work in our woods and, and have probably more mushroom substrates than we need uh, to move forward. And what I like to really, uh, you know, put out there when I'm teaching mushroom workshops is that we really want to think of uh, our mushrooms as a surplus of the management we're doing for forest health. I get concerned about a lot of the literature out there about mushroom production, which encourages growers to go into their woods and um, look for the straightest trees, the ones that are free of disease or defect, with the idea that being that if a tree is already infected with a fungal disease, it may not produce mushrooms. Um, you know, and basically choosing the straightest and, and essentially the best specimens. And what I actually like to encourage is, is, uh, is the opposite, to say, go into your woods, you know, work with a forester or work with uh, another 
uh, expert in the field and, and mark your trees for forest health. So actually pull out those, those dying, those diseased, those trees that have less uh, preferred structure or form and pull those out and make those uh, your mushroom products. Um, and there's really good justification for that and it, it changes the composition of the forest. If we, if we pull out all the best trees, we're just, we're just uh, shooting ourselves in the foot in the long term. So mushroom production also, the, the mushrooms are quite tolerant of, of, uh, of trees that may be less desirable for, for long-term forest health. So I want to kind of flip that on its head and really think about that as a, as a notion. I'm going to skip that one. Peter and I had a really long conversation about mushroom economics, and I don't know how that slide still made it in there, but um, it's kind of a complicated thing when we get into it. So um, hopefully we'll be putting out some information about mushroom economics, but we're not quite there yet. We have another slide coming up about some of the particulars of starting shiitake cultivation, but for now we'll move on to mushroom biology. And I'll just pause for a second. Uh, Thomas asked is, if black birch is a good substrate. Um, and your, the answer to that, uh, Thomas, is we didn't ever uh, trial that extensively at the Arnott Forest at Cornell here, um, but we have a grower actually just down the road in Wilseyville, New York, who swears by black birch uh, for shiitake and, and is, is running a business almost exclusively using black birch as a substrate. Um, and I think they have several thousand shiitake logs, so proof is in the pudding. Um, seems like a really good uh, potential. And uh, one more question from Lewis uh, Ward here. Um, question about beech trees that are already infected with beech bark disease and if they can be used for shiitake or other mushrooms. And, you know, again, um, we haven't done a specific research trial here at Cornell. Uh, anecdotally, what we found is that um, a beech that has beech bark disease has performed well um, in our mushroom trials in general. Um, We've never compared disease-free uh, with disease, but we have seen the mushrooms grow fine. And in consulting with some of our forest pathologists, in particular George Hudler, who's here um, at Cornell in the Department of Pathology, um, beech bark disease tends to colonize the bark and the outer surface. And with shiitake and other mushroom production, we're usually looking to colonize the, the sapwood of the tree and eventually the heartwood. And so the the disease, the beech bark disease and, and mushroom production actually should be somewhat compatible. Um, the only concern I would express with using uh, beech bark disease uh, beech would be to avoid those that has gone so far as to uh, have a lot of the bark uh, falling off because our biggest concern in mushroom production is actually moisture management. If the logs dry out too much, the mycelium will die. And so if the bark is already largely gone, then we're not going to have very good success, but not from a disease standpoint, from actually a moisture standpoint. And, and yes, Lewis, I agree, that is really good news and we're excited about the potential for, uh, to support, again, forest health and thinning out those diseased beech and using them for something really productive. And, uh, okay, a couple more here. We got uh, uh, Sheridan, uh, do deer like mushrooms? Um, deer, I have not had any problems with deer in my own uh, mushroom operation and we don't get a lot of reports of any deer damage. The most common pests are, are slugs, uh, of course, and occasionally rodents, sometimes chipmunks or uh, squirrels. I had a red squirrel issue last year uh, with some of my mushrooms, but they tend to just nibble. They don't do extensive damage. The slugs are really the one that, that cause a lot of problems. And uh, and then we have Shita Ronald says, uh, will shiitake grow on aspen or poplar uh, or only oyster? Um, we did a trial actually with big tooth aspen and shiitake. Um, I've inoculated several poplar logs. Um, and what I've found is that they, they tend to be poor fruity, fruiters of shiitake. Uh, I would only recommend oyster mushrooms for those. And uh, Chris asked if morels will be discussed. I think we're getting into that a little bit in the next section, but we'll get into why uh, we're not as focused on morels. I'll make sure to mention that as we, as we head through this next section. All right. So mushroom biology, I just want to hit on a few things about sort of the life cycle and, and this, this really unique organism that we're dealing with here, because it's really just simply not like a plant. And uh, it, it really goes to show sort of the limitations of science in a sense when it was assumed for so long in the scientific community that mushrooms were essentially uh, this plant, uh, is just a different form of plant. But when uh, research started to understand chlorophyll and the process of photosynthesis, um, and some experiments went on that realized that mushrooms would still grow uh, in the absence of 
of carbon dioxide, for example, and, and the absence of light, they realized that this organism was actually quite different uh, from plants. And interestingly enough, mushrooms and the fungal kingdom are actually closest related to the animal kingdom. Uh, so they're more closely related to animals than they are to plants. And the, probably the, the most striking similarities are the fact that mushrooms uh, absorb oxygen. They need oxygen in order to grow. Uh, and they expel carbon dioxide, just like we do. And they don't photosynthesize. They uh, gain their food sustenance from uh, breaking down uh, different materials with enzymes, which is essentially what our stomach does. And so very similar in, in, in those cases, but uh, really beyond that, uh, we start to depart in, in many different ways. And so we'll just look at this life cycle real quick. Look at this arrow here. Um, mushrooms start with spores. And so we have the spores up here in the right uh, hand corner of the, of the slide. And spores are, are microscopic, um, you know, essentially the, the beginnings of fruiting bodies. They're sort of analogous to, to seeds if we think about it in plants. But the difference is the spores actually don't have a, uh, a nutrient package. They don't, like a seed has starch or it has something that uh, will support the, the germoplasm to, to, uh, to start growing, versus spores um, are really just the genetic package. They're, they're the DNA. And they fly around in the atmosphere and they try to land on the appropriate place and then they'll start growing from there. So we always say that you know plants, the seeds actually pack a lunch versus the spores actually just they head out and hope to find some food along the way. Um, if those spores happen to land in a particular environment that's suitable for the mushrooms, they will germinate. And so we have this next part of spore germination, um, which is really just a, essentially cell walls growing out. And what's interesting is that if you think about root production in plants, we tend to have uh, plants branching out from one central place or branching out from multiple places. Well, spores can actually just divide and, and, and morph in, in, in various directions. They don't, or, they don't originate from a, a single source. Once that organism has begun, it can rapidly colonize whatever it's growing in. And that's one of the real benefits and the unique roles that fungal uh, networks play in forest health is the fact that they can uh, grow at, at a rate much faster than, than root systems in the plants and in the trees. Once those spores have uh, sort of amassed enough of, a, of a, a growth to to be significant, to be actually visible by the naked eye. We often call that mycelium. And so mycelium is actually the body of the organism. This is actually technically the mushroom. Um, eventually that mycelium becomes enough, uh, thick enough that it becomes what's called primordia. Primordia is uh, sort of analogous to the idea that before you, if you plant a fruit tree in your backyard, um, before that fruit tree will set apples, let's say, uh, it needs to go through enough of a, a massing of nutrients and energy. It needs to basically get its engine running at enough of a speed that the plant can sort of think of putting some of its energy towards fruit production. That's a pretty energy intensive process if we look at it biologically. And so the primordia is this point when the mycelium has a, accumulated enough mass and enough strength and enough energy production that it can think about fruiting. And mushrooms are essentially the fruit of this, this process. And they're the, the, the reproductive uh, part of this organism. Okay, so the mushroom first pops out of the ground, and if it's a gilled mushroom like we have in the picture here, the, the, it'll pop up sort of like a little button, and that cap will then start to open. And all of the spores are actually in those gills underneath. And so as that cap opens, it'll release the spores, and, and the cycle starts all over. Um, what's interesting about mushrooms, and if you start growing them, is, is really amazing, is how uh, accurate they are really being uh, weather monitors. So we'll have buttons showing up. Right now we have different shiitakes that are showing up and they'll, they'll stay in that button form for days or even weeks. And right when the conditions are right, then that, that cap will open and, and that's usually when you start to harvest. So, you know, they, they really wait for the perfect humidity, perfect temperature in order to, in order to start going. Uh, one of the most important ways, if we're whether we're cultivating or if we're wild crafting um, mushrooms, uh, to identify them, to make sure we know what we're eating, is through spore prints. And a spore print is nothing more than uh, sort of the footprint uh, a mushroom will leave behind. And what you do is if you harvest a cap um, that's relatively fresh and you put it on a colored piece of paper and leave it usually overnight, you'll get a, a spore print the next morning. So this is an example here. Um, shiitake, one of the nice things about shiitakes, and this is often a fear that we address, is how do I know what's coming out of my log? Is it gonna, is it gonna be shiitake or might it be something else? There's very few lookalikes to shiitake, and we can pretty much guarantee that if you've inoculated a log with shiitake, 
if something pops out that looks like a brown uh, capped gilled mushroom with a stem, it's it's 99% going to be shiitake. Um, the only other look like we could draw a comparison to is um, this Galernia uh, species over here that shows up in the woods. It does fruit out of logs. We've never had a case of it showing up on a, a specifically inoculated shiitake log. Could happen, but if you weren't sure and you really wanted to test, you can see that the spore prints are quite different. So the shiitake has a white print versus the, the other, which has a, a brown spore print. And in addition to you know thinking about, we've, we've talked about spores as the way mushrooms actually reproduce themselves. Well, the problem with that when we actually get into cultivating is spores are sort of analogous to seeds. And, and we know that if we start a plant from a seed, the genetic variation will express itself uh, to a wide degree, depending on the species. And so, you know, if we find a black locust tree and we really like it and we harvest that seed, the ones we grow out from that seed will have some characteristics of the parent, but not necessarily uh, all of the characteristics that we want. And so these are when often things like apples, when we know we want a certain trait, are grafted, right? So we take a clone of the, of the parent plant and then we graft that onto a rootstock and, and grow out something that's genetically identical to the parent. It's the same with mushrooms. It's really time intensive uh, and labor intensive and, and actually really difficult to propagate mushrooms um, from spores. And we don't usually do that unless there's a really good reason. And so with the way we actually domesticate a fungus, if we find one that's growing well that we want to deal with, is you can see here on the slide, we have first, we, we harvest our wild mushroom. We take it actually into the laboratory. And the reason for this is because uh, we have thousands of spores um, all around us all the time in the air, uh, waiting to land on the perfect, uh, the perfect place. And so uh, molds are also, and yeasts are also uh, in the fungal community. And so if we really want to isolate this mushroom and, and its genetics, we have to do it in a sterile environment. Um, so what we'll do is actually take a cutting. You can see on the slide in the middle, there's just a little slice of that mushroom uh, on a Petri dish. It's usually on some kind of uh, like a, a potato uh, starch or some kind of sugar, essentially some food for the mushroom. We'll grow that out for several weeks in the lab, and then we'll transfer that eventually to a sterilized uh, grain, usually, usually rye or barley. From there then, once that's grown out several times over, we'll put it down into bags, uh, in, usually in sawdust. Okay, and let that colonize. You can see the mycelium on this, this bag here as it grows out. And eventually it gets to the point where the mycelium is fully colonized, the, the substrate in the bag. This is all sterile at this point. And then we'll take it out into the field and actually cultivate it. So we'll inoculate these totem logs. So this is a really challenging proposition on a, on a farm scale or on a homeowner scale because most of us don't have the means or desire to have a sterile laboratory. And so the good news is that spawn is, is relatively inexpensive. Usually we're talking less than a dollar per log to inoculate. So it's usually better for us to, um, to pay someone else to do that lab work. All right, and then we'll look at a few classes of mushrooms before we really get into some nitty gritty of inoculation. Um, the first we have are <coughs> what are called the mycorrhizal mushrooms. Um, mycorrhizal mushrooms are mushroom species that um, myco means mushroom and rhizal means root. And so these are mushrooms that have evolved to have a symbiotic relationship with plants. You can see in the slide here uh, a research trial that looks at um, white pine seedlings that are grown uh, without mycorrhizal mushrooms uh, or, or, or with. And you can see the ones on the right are obviously doing quite better. Um, but basically, the mycorrhizal mushrooms cut a deal with the plants. They say, hey, plants, you can, you can pull uh, sun out of the atmosphere. You can create sugars and carbohydrates out of that sunlight. Um, I'll trade you some of that for some of these enzymes I'm, I'm decomposing down in the soil. And also, I'll extend your root network further into the soil and actually capture more nutrients and, and more water and bring those to your roots. And what we find is that actually out in the woods, anytime there's a tree, there's usually a mycorrhizal mushroom associated with that tree species. Um, there's very few plants actually in general that don't have a mycorrhizal uh, association. Brassicas, uh, kales, and collards are one of the only classes of vegetables, for example, that don't have a known uh, mycorrhizal association. And so what's important to know about that is that these kind of uh, mushrooms, and morels, uh, back to Chris's question, are one of them, and chanterelles, truffles, which are obviously highly sought after, and porcinis. One of the issues is um, they're all mycorrhizal, and so cultivating them becomes an a exponentially difficult challenge. Uh, so the example is you can read up about truffle cultivation, 
typically the way truffles are cultivated is you find an existing tree that has truffle culture around it, has mushrooms known to be fruiting. Uh, then you plant seedlings of that same tree species around that, uh, that parent tree, and you wait about five years or so. Then you dig up those seedlings and you try to um, transplant them and hope that the mycorrhizal mushrooms went along with it. So essentially with mycorrhizal mushrooms, the problem is it's really hard to mimic those, those uh, ecosystem type of, of uh, conditions in order to get production. So we don't see people having much success with any of these types of mushrooms in terms of production. Once in a while you'll hear about this success story and it causes people to, to uh, run home and, and buy a bunch of spawn and try it out. But by and large, the successes are, are few and far between. And what's important with the mycorrhizal fungi, this is a, an interesting article you could read about, is this is a, a research that's been done out in the Pacific Northwest. You can see the link there, chrismazer.com uh, backslash truffle, uh, is an interesting uh, analogy of this, where the mycorrhizal fungi actually plays this really critical role in, in the relationship between dug fir trees, uh, flying squirrels, and, and the spotted owl. And I recommend checking out that article if you're interested in this type of relationship. Um, as we're cultivating mushrooms, we don't expect to actually uh, mimic this type of sophistication. And so what we're actually usually doing is cultivating what are called saprophytes. And saprophytic mushrooms are otherwise known as decomposer mushrooms. And it's very simple. They eat dead organic matter. They eat dead stuff. All right, so here's shiitakes in production in, in my mushroom yard. And they're, they're consuming the dead wood that are from the trees that we've, we've culled, right? So that's... That's great, and it's often easiest to produce the saprophytic mushrooms. Those are ones that we can mimic the conditions because essentially if we find the right substrate, which is what we impregnate the mycelium into, and we find the right conditions in terms of uh, temperature and humidity, uh, then we can have good, good uh, results in our, in our production. Of course, there are some, as I mentioned, some saprophytes that are notoriously difficult to cultivate. This is one I'm trying to grow, again, in my backyard. This is the chicken of the woods. Um, a, a incredibly uh, delectable, amazing mushroom. Um, and I, I've sort of resigned to, I might see some emerge in my mushroom yard someday, but I just go to the local, our local state forest and I find them in abundance. They, they tend to grow on hemlocks and oaks that have been down. You can see this one's been down for a while. The bark is, is more or less gone. Um, and they tend to, they'll start coming out this time of year and, and into the early summer. Um, and sometimes you also see them in the, in the fall. Uh, so, you know, some saprophytes, again, aren't worth it. So just saying something's a decomposer doesn't mean it's going to be easy to, to grow. And folks always ask about, well, what about the, the button mushrooms that I find in the grocery store? Uh, well, what's interesting is that button mushrooms, uh, cremini mushrooms, the, the little brown-capped button mushrooms, and portobello are actually all the same species. And they account for over 90% of the mushrooms we consume in the United States. These mushrooms are uh, saprophytic, they are decomposers. Uh, the challenge there is they, they don't grow on something like logs, like shiitake. They're actually grown in, in uh, compost, in, in a three-stage compost, uh, indoors again. Uh, it's very hard to grow them outside. And so, again, you know, just because it's a saprophyte doesn't mean it's easy to grow. And so we have these massive grow houses, you know, in Pennsylvania, different parts of the country. Um, I love all of these mushrooms. I consume them just as much as the shiitakes I grow. But as an agroforester, as a forest farmer, I'm not going to think about uh, the potential for these because it's simply uh, much more of an indoor or climate controlled type process to produce these. One possibility that's related is, is what's called the almond agaricus. And almond agaricus is a mushroom that you can grow uh, at home in your compost pile and then transfer into the garden. And it does have a similar taste to those, those flavors of mushrooms. So there are, you know, again, more species than one of the things I like to tell people is, you know, for all the amount of plant breeding we've done to the point where we can get tomatoes of pretty much every shade of the, of the rainbow or even carrots every shade of the rainbow, you know, we've done, um, you know, 1% of that of mushroom cultivation. We, we have not done the breeding work in order to find these sort of different desirables. So it's actually not a far stretch to be able to grow a portobello in your garden bed someday, but it takes some, someone or, or multiple people and years of research to develop those, those strains and, and naturalize them outside. Um, certainly a possibility, but not something that a lot of universities are, are, or, or individuals are actually working on right now. So if you're interested in those button type mushrooms, almond agaricus would be one to, to look into. I'll just briefly mention uh, parasitic mushrooms. These are cordyceps. 
if you uh, Google uh, cordyceps and um, zombie ants, <laughs> believe it or not, um, you'll find some interesting videos about these mushrooms that are in the Amazon that actually infect the brain of uh, ants, leafcutter ants in the Amazon, and cause them to act very erratically and then climb up to the top of trees in the Amazon jungle where they consume them finally and then they put their fruiting body, as you can see in this picture, up out of the head and sporulate from there. So really crazy when you start to get into, into the mushroom world of all these different types. Obviously, these aren't one we're going to eat, but they're very interesting, a very interesting expression of, of the fungal kingdom. It's a pretty fun video to watch, too. Um, and finally, then there's these sort of semi-parasitic mushrooms, and you may have seen this or found it around if you have a lot of birch in your woods. Um, chaga mushrooms, uh, pretty highly sought after, uh, really nutritious mushroom. Don't really look like a mushroom as we think. They look sort of more like a, maybe a canker fungus or something like that. Um, but you can, again, Google Paul Stamets plus Huffington Post plus Chaga and find a really nice article about Chaga mushroom. Um, amazing medicinal mushroom. And the reason it's semi-parasitic is it actually infects the birch tree from a pretty young age. But what's interesting is the mushroom sort of hangs on in that tree for years and years and years, pretty much spends its whole life in the tree. And then as that tree is dying, it actually uh, sort of takes over and then fruits. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't parasitize the tree early on. It actually is only when the tree is, it seems to naturally die. Um, one of the theories from some of the, the those that are studying this is that the tree actually, the, the mushroom is somewhat of a, a symbiont in the sense that it occupies the niche of the, of the fungal uh, entities in the tree and actually keeps disease out um, while this birch tree is growing. So interesting stuff there. You make a really good tea out of chaga or you can make like an extract, but you don't usually eat it. Uh, like, a, like a shiitake or something. All right, <clears throat> so lots of interesting background stuff. Let's get into some cultivation. This is the basic process that we're going to be looking for uh, in our woods when we're thinking about cultivating log-grown mushrooms. Um, the first step being uh, substrate acquisition, which is a fancy term for cutting trees down. All right. Um, second thing we're going to do is inoculate that, which is when we're actually putting the mycelium into the log. Then there's the third step, which is colonization, which is sort of a waiting period. We often call this the spawn run, where we have to let that spawn, again, grow out to enough of a critical mass that it can think about fruiting. Um, so with most mushrooms, that's often a year. Okay, So the hardest thing when you first get a mushroom cultivation is realizing that you have inoculated things, uh, let's say, now in April. And you're probably not going to start seeing mushrooms until the following April. And that's just part of the reality of, of what we're dealing with, is we have to sort of have this waiting time. You know, the good news is you'll have your, your yields for several years after that. The fourth step would be obviously harvesting. And then finally, if you're growing for commercial, would be marketing, or if you're growing for hobby, consuming. We'll break those down just a little bit. We're going to look at shiitake uh, production uh, first and foremost here. So shiitake, uh, originally from Japan, shi, uh, meaning oak, taki mushroom, so mushroom of the oak. Um, so often uh, oak family species are the, are the best options for cultivating shiitake. Uh, we also find that sugar maple is a, is a great substrate. And so we usually recommend the best species being sugar maple, red or white oak, um, and, uh, and beech as, as preferred substrates. As was answered, uh, mentioned in the questions, we've had good luck on, on black birch from some of our farmer growers. Um, hop hornbeam and ironwood are also decent substrates um, and tend to hold up quite well. They're very dense wood. Um, and down in the south, sweet gum tends to be a really good uh, tree species. Other than that, it's really a shot in the dark. Some do better, some do worse, but we found that they'll, all those species are ones that perform more or less on the same par. Oh, and I mentioned that, but so, so we're looking for fresh logs. This is the other thing. We get a lot of growers who say, well, I, you know, I, this, this, uh, this sugar maple tree dropped down in a storm last October. Can I inoculate that now? And the answer is no. You really need fresh logs that are less than three months old. You're ideally looking for logs that are about four to eight inches in diameter and that are about 36 to 40 uh, inches long. I should say inches, not feet. That would be a, a rather long shiitake log. Um, and as I've mentioned, the species that are, that are preferred. And uh, Walter asks about chestnut oak. Um, Walter, my guess would be that chestnut oak would do quite well. Um, I don't see any reason it wouldn't perform differently than the other oaks. Um, but what we always say with a new species is, you know, give it give it a shot. Try four or five uh, logs one year and see how it does before you commit uh, your whole operation to that. 
uh, with shiitake and with what we call bolt cultivation, which we're mostly encouraging people to do on shiitake. We first drill holes to inoculate. Um, there's sort of two ways to do this. You could use a regular corded drill like you see on the right there, uh, or you could use an angle grinder, which is something that the mushroom industry uh, has sort of come up with, uh, that you can buy an adapter in a bit that will fit on an angle grinder, and it drills your logs about 10 times as fast. Um, so if you're, again, like me, inoculating three or 400 logs in a season, you really usually go with the angle grinder because it's just that much faster. The quarter drill, we had a race at Camp Mushroom this past weekend, and the quarter drill uh, was far, far behind. The, the person was done with the log with the angle grinder, and the quarter drill, they were only on their, their second row. You know, so it's pretty dramatically different. Um, if you're going to go with uh, sawdust spawn, we'll talk about this in a minute, your bit size will be 7 16 or 12 millimeter. And if you're doing dowels, it'll be a 5 16 bit. So spawn, um, this is sawdust spawn. Um, again, sawdust spawn is a little bit cheaper. Um, it tends to colonize the log a little bit faster because the, the, the mycelium has been put into a, a, a rather high surface area mixture. But usually for inoculating, you have to invest again in these tools. You can see these inoculation tools, which are essentially a little plunger that you dip into the spawn and then plunge into the log. And each of those tools costs about 30 bucks. And so often, again, commercial growers will focus on sawdust as their uh, option for, for inserting the spawn. There's also dowels. Uh, so if you're, uh, again, a homeowner, uh, maybe you're just thinking about doing 10 or 20 logs, usually we recommend to use a, a, a regular drill, unless you already have an angle grinder, it's not worth the extra money, and use these dowels, which you can just hammer in uh, to the holes. And again, those are a 5 16 bit that you would use. And so they're a little more expensive. The spawn run is a little bit slower, but it's really not that noticeable. It's definitely the way to go if you're, if you're not looking commercial in terms of not investing as much in the, in the equipment. So after you insert the spawn in whatever way you've chosen, um, we're going to wax them. Uh, so you cover them with a wax. This is a food grade uh, cheese wax. Uh, it's a mixture of paraffin and beeswax. And that's mainly just to keep the spawn from falling out keep the critters from attacking the spawn, and keep your moisture going in the log. We don't recommend necessarily waxing the ends. You'll sometimes see that in the books. Um, there's really, we did a, a study at Cornell that looked at the difference of waxing the ends versus not, and really our conclusion was it just wasted a lot of wax. So you don't really need to wax the ends. And then the finally next thing is really to wait. And like I said, for shiitake, um, we're looking at a six to eight month spawn run. So if you do the math, if we were to inoculate today, by the time we get to that end of that spawn run, it's actually winter, right? So that's why we usually say, well, it's really the next spring before you get your, your mushrooms producing. Um, uh, if you're in the southern states or in states that don't get as cold as us, I am jealous. And also, usually you can get your, your mushrooms then to fruit uh, in the early fall and that sort of thing. Uh, usually what we say is after you've inoculate your logs, you're going to set up what's called a lane yard, which is the place your logs will lay. And the things you want to look for are consistent shade. So hemlock in, in the northeast is, is ideal, uh, or pine, uh, for a lane yard. Uh, slope being, of, of course, important to think about access um, in terms of and stacking your logs and being able to work with things. Uh, access to water, because you will soak your logs if you want them to fruit. Um, and, and access, of course, in terms of vehicles, in terms of moving your logs around. There's different ways, many different ways to stack logs. And on our website, you can find a lot of information about these different ways. Um, most common is this, this crib stack here when you're waiting for those logs to, to spawn run. And then usually after you soak them, you'll lean them up in what's called an A-frame and have them fruit sort of like this. So you have all access to all sides of the log. There's also this low A-frame style or what's called a Japanese hill stack, which is a very innovative method for stacking logs on a, on a very steep slope. So step five for this would be to soak the logs once the spawn has run through. And you can usually see mycelium coming out on the ends of the logs. You can soak them um, either, whoops, sorry about that, uh, usually in a pond or for some reason I have a, a picture of a tank here that didn't show up on our slides. But often I'll soak my logs in, a, in an old stock tank. And then you'll lean them up again, like I mentioned, and, and harvest them uh, off, of the, off of the log. Uh, the, the timing is really critical. Um, often we see growers who, who harvest their mushrooms when they're like this, when the caps 
have actually fully opened and are flat, that's actually a little bit late. Okay, so what you want to look for is when the cap is still curled under, like this one. It's slightly curled under. The mushrooms are still a nice, rich brown color. Um, this is really too late, and they're certainly still edible. But this is sort of your peak in terms of taste. Uh, this, the picture here on the left is actually what they look like when they're first coming out of the log as little buttons. And usually from soaking to when your mushrooms are ready to harvest is, is roughly five to seven days. After that soaking, uh, if you soak your logs, what you have to do is give your logs uh, some time to rest. <clears throat> and that usually takes um, about six to eight weeks. And so the way we think about this is that we uh, give our logs sort of a, a chance to rest by stacking them again in a rick stack. And if we think about the numbers of logs we want to deal with, if that's the next slide, yeah. We usually divide our logs by eight, okay? So again, if you imagine saying, okay, I'm going to have enough logs for one meal a week, right? So I'm going to uh, have eight logs. I'm going to soak one every week. And then by the time I've gotten around to that first log again, um, I've allowed the other logs to have sufficient rest time, right? So if you, you know, for one meal a week, I would say eight logs would do you pretty well. You'd get about a quarter to a half pound of mushrooms per week if you're soaking them. Maybe for a family, if you want to think about getting about a pound a week, 32 logs. Again, you would divide it by eight, soak four every week, you get about a pound. Small business, you might be looking at about 500 or, or more logs, and you'd soak you know, a few hundred a week and, and get 40 or 50 pounds, which is enough to sell to, to multiple restaurants or to, to a farmer's market, something like that. That gives you some sense of, of volume. So there's a few questions here. I'm going to, I think we're at that. Oh, let me let me finish this part and I'll answer those questions. Um, here's a here's a budget from our that grant I mentioned before, where we took actual numbers from real-time farmers. This is important to think about because you're you're not going to go from zero to 400 logs necessarily. Usually, what you do is you add a little bit every year. So this budget is based off adding 100 logs a year. And so in 2014, if you started in 2011, you would have about 400 logs. So this is sort of your total um, costs. Um, and, and subtracting from all the sales you've made. And this budget is not including labor, uh, which is often, unfortunately, what, what farmers tend to do with their time is not, not actually value that as a per hour rate. And so we're looking for actually a loss in the first year in terms of an investment, but then in the second, third, and fourth year, we're getting sort of exponential growth and, and maybe making 5,000 a year or so off of just 400 logs. So a pretty good side venture for a lot of farmers. If we add in the the farm labor, which is important, and I, we advocate that to our growers. Our profits look a little less. We actually have a loss um, the second year as well. But again, we're paying ourselves uh, along the way. And that's usually a better way to do your budgeting for a farm enterprise. So somewhere between $2,500 and $5,000 a year, once you get your mushroom operation going, if you had four or 500 logs, it's not a bad thing to, to, to consider adding. OK, I'm going to answer these questions. <coughs> and. And then we'll talk about totem inoculation. We'll probably go a little over over one o'clock. Peter, is that okay if we if we do that? I don't remember what you said about time. I know some people may have to leave if they're on their lunch break. All right. So I'm going to go back here. We have questions. So we have first of all, are there any softwood species that support mushroom cultivation? Paul asks. Uh, yes, there are, and we're going to get to that next, so I'll, I'll, I'll hold that till then. Um, Tom asks if you can inoculate a living tree. Um, there's really not, again, the mushrooms we're interested in are, um, are saprophytes, so they're going to eat dead wood. There are some nursery folks out there that are inoculating young trees with uh, chaga with the idea that they're going to support, uh, sort of occupy that fungal niche in the tree and maybe prevent disease and maybe fruit, but that's very experimental. So there's really not usually a lot of justification for inoculating a live tree because there's just not the type of mushrooms we want. The only ones that would thrive on a live tree are parasitic mushrooms, um, and we don't tend to eat those. They, they don't tend to be very tasty. Uh, Chris asks, can you give more info on the soaking? How do you know when to soak and for how long? Yeah. Um, usually you know when to start soaking if, uh, again, you know six or eight months have elapsed you'll usually see white mycelium showing up on the end of a log. And you're really not going to damage the log. So usually what I do is I've inoculated my logs often in the spring of, of a year. So let's say this year, 
starting next uh, spring, I'll, I'll think about soaking them because they probably had enough time. And usually I'll start to see some of that mycelium coming out at the end. Um, usually when you soak, you soak for uh, 24 hours and, and then you'll pull them out. Um, you don't want to ever soak, uh, you do not want to soak your logs more than 48 hours or the mycelium could actually uh, drown. All right. And we've had evidence that soaking over four hours will also stimulate fruiting, but we usually recommend 24. Uh, Lewis asked if I have a link to that paper. Yes, so we'll talk about our website at the end here. Um, and it's, I'll just say it right now, but we'll mention it again. It's, it's uh, mushrooms.cals.cornell.edu. And that website has all of our research papers, including a lot of information and a whole other presentation that Alan Matthews of our project gave about some of the figures and numbers for, for uh, shiitake production. And let's see, other questions here. Do the logs have to have bark on them, or could you uh, split sugar maple logs to use? So Ronald asks that question. Great question. Um, no, we actually need the bark intact. As I mentioned before, moisture management is the biggest uh, hurdle in good mushroom production. So we never split logs because that basically opens up the log to drying out very quickly. So it's a good thing if you want firewood. If you've ever um, harvested firewood and you leave it out and you know you haven't split it, you know how long it takes to dry out. And that's sort of ideal for mushrooms. You want to slow that, that drying out as quickly as possible. So you need to always have your bark intact and, and never use split wood for inoculation. Here's Bill Allen asks, how many times can you use a log? Um, if you think, if you start to do the math about uh, you know, getting your logs on a rotation and soaking them and then letting them rest, usually, in, at least in the Northeast, you can get, you know, each log can be soaked twice a year um, and then given that appropriate rest time. And usually you can keep that up for about four years. So we've averaged about eight soaks, uh, eight flushes per log before it's really spent. And Ronald asked if we can get copies of the charts. And, and Peter's mentioned that you can save this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I will also post this on our mushroom website when it's out. And, uh, and like I said, we have plenty of charts and diagrams uh, in, our, in our research page. So we'll look at that in a minute. All right, so we're going to get into totem inoculation here. Hope you'll be able to stay with us, or else you could, you could view the video if you have to get off your lunch break and come back uh, later and check out the rest of this. Totem inoculation is a really nice complement to, uh, to shiitake uh, cultivation, or, or what we call bolt cultivation, where you're drilling all those holes in the log. Um, totem inoculation is much quicker and much simpler, and it allows us to also expand the palette of, uh, of trees as well that we can use in our, in our mushroom garden. All right, so first natural candidate uh, would be oyster mushrooms. Lots of different ones out there. There's yellow ones, there's pink ones, there's blue ones, there's gray ones, there's brown ones. And what's cool about oysters is they can actually, they'll eat almost anything. And so this picture here uh, on the left is uh, oyster mushrooms that are actually grown on uh, you know, coffee grounds that, um, that my girlfriend uh, saved and basically dumped her coffee in a bucket every morning and then inoculated it with oysters and got a few flushes before they were spent. Um, you can see down here this woman with the toilet paper. You can actually, sometimes with classes, we'll actually inoculate toilet paper rolls just to show people that how easy it is to grow oyster mushrooms. Um, but usually for our log-grown forest owners, we're looking at totems, and we'll talk about totem cultivation, where you're sandwiching the mycelium between uh, two sections of log, and you can see a nice fruiting here. Um, I believe this is uh, an aspen, a quaking aspen. And what's nice about oysters is it tends to prefer the softer hardwoods. So we're getting good results on, on aspen, whether it's quaking aspen or, um, or the big tooth. Uh, and cottonwood does quite well, and to some degree like red maple. Um, as well, will do quite well. We don't tend to inoculate uh, um, conifer species because the resins in the wood tend to uh, inhibit uh, fungal growth. The other one we've really gotten excited about at Cornell and actually have some really good data on now is, is heresium or lion's mane. Uh, lion's mane mushroom is, is a, a bizarre mushroom. You can see from the photo here on the left uh, that it's actually not a, a gilled mushroom. It's, a, it's, a, it's called an icicle mushroom. So the the spores are dropped from all those little icicles that come off. And it's just an absolutely delectable mushroom. I mean, it tastes pretty much like seafood, like scallions or something. Um, just really delicious. And I've, I've wild harvested this for years. Um, at Cornell, we've had uh, decent success with it on, on sugar maple. 
um, as well as red maple. But our best species by far is beech. And again, uh, certainly a candidate for trees with beech bark disease seems to do fine with the, the lion's mane. So we're pretty much across the board recommending beech as the species for, for lion's mane cultivation. And what's interesting with our, some of our Cornell research is, is Ken had a grad student a few years ago who um, <coughs> compared this um, a commercially available isolate. An isolate is simply um, someone harvested a mushroom from the wild and grew it out in a lab and then inoculated uh, logs with it, um, as we saw on the previous slide. And so this one on the left is FPP, uh, FFP3, that's for field and forest, um, which is a mushroom spawn producer out in, uh, in Wisconsin. And she was comparing sort of uh, production with uh, what, she, what she called HE3, HE4, and HE5, which were three mushrooms that she and a local mushroom forager harvested from around the Finger Lakes area, isolated in the lab, and then grew out. And what she found was that, you know, <coughs> finding these locally adapted strains actually proved to uh, be better for mushroom production. Uh, and so now we're working with Field and Forest to actually produce some of these different strains and field test them uh, for different uses. Lion's mane tends to fruit really well in the spring and in the fall. And same with oyster, you tend to get your flushes in the spring or the fall. And so they're very different than shiitake uh, in the sense that shiitake you can get pretty much uh, from, you know, again in the northeast you could get a May to October harvest. You could have flushes of mushrooms every week throughout the season and you can actually force them by soaking them in a tank. These totems, these other two mushrooms, the lion's mane and the oyster, we're not going to soak them in a tank. Um, we're not going to try to force them. We let sort of Mother Nature do her own work on that. And we usually get flushes in, in the fall and the spring, like I said. And so what we usually recommend to a commercial audience is to build a business around shiitake because you can have those reliable yields and then grow some of these other ones on the side. Um, and you'll get what you get sort of thing. But if you already have an existing mushroom um, uh, audience, it's going to be really easy for you to, to get this out uh, and sell them. That's sort of is another another chart that shows um, we actually had in this year, I think this was 2008, um, none of the, the local isolates, the HE3, 4, 5, actually produced at all in the spring. So we have the field and forest actually doing really well in the spring. And then in the fall, the field and forest one doing very poorly, but the other local isolates doing really well. And so what this speaks to is really the fact that, you know, it's not never one, one strain of mushroom that you want to cultivate. Uh, diversity is king. Just like in our garden, we want to have beets that fruit early in the season, mid-season, late season. Uh, we're going to do the same with our mushrooms and try to expand upon uh, different strains for different times of the year and different conditions. Okay, <clears throat> let me take a water drink here. All right, <clears throat> I haven't lost my voice yet. That's good. Um, so totems, we're going to be looking for, again, fresh logs. So we want less than three months old. Uh, we're going to look for logs that are actually a little bit bigger um, than the other ones, 10 to 14 inches in diameter. And I've even inoculated up to 20 inches, like pretty pretty beefy wood. Um, and the main reason for that is they just tend to stand up better. Uh, they don't fall over. Um, but you can go, you could probably go less than 10 inches if you were able to stack, uh, stack them well. Um, usually we recommend that you start with a two foot long section and then you cut it in half. So you cut it into one foot sections. What I've learned over the years, it's really important that you essentially leave them in the two foot sections and move them to the place where you're ready to inoculate, cut them in half, and make sure you keep those two halves together because if you get them mixed up, it's really hard to put the puzzle back together. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll sandwich the spawn uh, in between all these different sections, okay? Uh, like I said, our most recommended species are beech um, for lion's mane and then aspen and cottonwood for, for oyster. Um, that's not an exhaustive list, and we actually, with oyster in particular, have not done a lot of research at Cornell. And so any of the woods you can think of um, that are similar, like softer hardwoods, would be good, suitable species to, to try out with these mushrooms. And what we usually recommend is for, for woodlot owners to look around, again, at the forest management objectives, uh, what trees they'd like to call, and try some of those out. In the first year, you know, only inoculate two or three just to see if it works. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, rather than hunting around and trying to find these perfect species. If you don't have beech in your woods, then try something else that's appropriate for, uh, for potential cultivation. All right, I'll answer this one question from Lewis before I uh, 
sort of go through step by step the totem process. He asks if I recommend plant-based chain bar oil. Um, Peter, you might have some thoughts on this as well, but what I tend to use is is not the not a veggie a canola oil uh, type bar oil. What I tend to use is biodegradable uh, oil from the manufacturer of my saw. So steel uh, is the saw I have, and it makes they make a biodegradable chainsaw oil. I've tended to find that the vegetable oils um, really degrade and, and don't uh, tend to give as good a lubrication on the saw. And uh, I think you'd be fine cutting them with a with a you know petroleum-based oil as well. Um, we again haven't done specific research on that, but I always try to advocate for the biodegradable stuff because um, it is spitting out into the environment all the time. So if Peter has another thought, he's welcome to chime in. <laughs> Yeah, so Peter says he doesn't have any experience or he's used standard uh, oil. Uh, interesting side note, um, Paul Stamets, who has his mushroom company, is called Fungi Perfecti, which is out in the northwest. Uh, he, for a while, I don't know if he's still selling it, was selling um, what he was calling uh, mushroom bar oil, which was a vegetable oil that was inoculated with, with oyster mushrooms. The idea being that as you're wor working around the woods and sawing everything up, you're inoculating your woods with, with oysters. Um, Sounds really great and compelling, but simply has not worked. I've never heard of anyone having mushrooms show up in their woods from, from using that bar oil. So a little bit of a gimmicky thing there, but nice idea. Maybe there's, there's a future in it. All right, so let's look at um, totem inoculation, okay? Uh, if you visit our website today, you'll actually see this version of our, of our fact sheet on totem inoculation. I'm currently updating that, and it'll be changed. One of the biggest changes, and, and we have to take a new series of photographs, because you see here there's plastic bags involved. And we're actually trying to move away from plastic bags because, mainly because of the aesthetic value, honestly. It doesn't look very good in the forest. Um, we're, we're switching over to paper bags, and, and we seem to have uh, equally good results. And the paper bags are nice because they actually biodegrade in the woods. So but what you're going to do regardless is you're going to start here on the left, and you're going to put down, what we're recommending now is actually putting down a piece of cardboard on the ground um, and putting down a handful of spawn, you can see there. And then putting your first uh, chunk of the totem right on top of that. Okay. And then we'll add uh, a handful of spawn right in the middle of the two. All right, even it out and then put that top uh, chunk of the totem on there. And then put the last piece on and put, uh, again, spawn on top. The other difference, actually, what we're recommending now and what we're starting to pr play with in our mushroom yard is actually cutting off um, about an inch cookie on the top of this log. And this last little bit of spawn that we put on the top, we're actually sandwiching between this second log and the cookie. And the reason for that is what we've uh, mostly found out is that um, by putting it on top, it often gets eaten or, or dries out too fast. It doesn't seem to actually inoculate into the log as well. All right. So we're basically sandwiching spawn on the bottom, on the middle, and on the top. And again, if you go to the website today, the fact sheet is going to suggest this method with the, the plastic bags where you have one underneath and you pull up, and then the other one you put on top. What we're going to uh, switch our fact sheet to is, is more of a paper bag um, encouragement. So you'll see that change coming shortly. Another alteration to the, uh, to the, the totem method is what's called the wedge method or the stump method. And this is uh, a potential for if you are cutting a tree and are interested in inoculating it sort of on the spot there. Um, you can actually cut wedges out with your chainsaw and then you basically pack spawn in that wedge hole, put the wedge piece back on and then tack it in with a nail. All right. And so this is nice. You could, you could also do this by harvesting logs and then cutting out these notches as well. You don't have to have it as a stump in the ground. But another nice variation um, I don't think there's any preference. There's a slight more exposure in this wedge method to uh, from mycelium to the interior of the tree, which in theory would lead to a faster spawn run and maybe mushrooms in shorter time frame. But really no evidence to specifically support that. Um, we have a, a, a fellow out in, uh, he's in North Carolina, Rodney Webb, and uh, he did one of these stump wedge methods. And really remarkable, once that spawn run was completed, which took about a year, he got uh, enough mushrooms over the next three years through these flushes to make about $500 from this one from this one stump. So really worth his time, uh, in other words. These are uh, golden oyster mushrooms. And I don't know the, the tree species from the, from the bark there. Um, but 
good potential there. And it, what I recommend again is 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 if you want the reliable fruiters, go with the shiitakes. And then if you want to experiment with totems or with these wedge uh, wedge methods, use the lion's mane and the and the oyster for that. All right, one more style of inoculation, and then we'll sort of wrap things up uh, for this webinar. Uh, bed inoculation uh, is is an interesting. Um, potential too, and, and we may create beds of, of mushrooms in our forests. We might also think about doing this in our gardens as well. So Stropharia, uh, the wine cap mushroom, is really the best candidate to, to play with in this type of inoculation. So the, the full name is Stropharia rugoso annulata, um, really nice reddish mushroom, uh, really distinctive ring here around the, around the stem. And this mushroom really tastes a, a lot like a portobello mushroom uh, soaked in red wine. So if that sounds good to you, then you might want to try Stropharia out. Uh, the nice thing about Stropharia is sort of the ease of, of inoculation. Um, Stropharia doesn't need an isolated environment like we have with a log that's been freshly cut, that's been sort of has its bark intact. You can essentially inoculate Stropharia into a bed of mulch. And if there's other fungi in there, um, if the wood chips are somewhat old, it doesn't seem to really be a problem. We're currently sort of developing best management practices for Stropharia because a lot of people uh, have had success but can't tell us exactly how they did it or why. So at Cornell, we are trying to do some research plots now um, with some of our cooperating farmers to determine what the best practices may be. What we think it is, is to basically layer the stropharia in, in, a, in a mulched system. And basically the first layer is, is to uh, either remove any vegetation or if you're in the forest, remove the leaf litter and actually get down to bare ground to um, put your put some sawdust down. Again, the fresher, the better. Um, a lot of woodworkers around in your, your local parts probably have some surplus sawdust. And basically lay down a thin layer. We're talking about uh, maybe a half inch of sawdust. Um, then you put the spawn down, which again is a sawdust inoculated spawn. And then you put either wood chips or straw on top. And that's usually about two to four inches of wood chips or straw. Um, you can do this in little patches. So you could imagine in your garden or in the woods making little, you know, one foot by one foot patches of these. Or you can also do entire beds of this. Um, a, a bag of spawn will usually do about a four by eight or 32 square foot bed. That's about as much as I can offer in terms of a, of a strategy where you have this kind of layering. And the idea with the layering is that you have the, the sawdust, which is sort of like if you're starting a fire, it's sort of like the kindling. It's something that the spawn can very quickly colonize into. And then you have the, uh, the wood chips and the straw um, being very willing to, uh, to be the long-term sort of food for the, for the mushroom. Um, Chris asks, uh, oh, there's a couple questions here. Uh, so Peter first asks, for layering stropharia, does the wood need to be hardwood? Uh, and can the straw include chicken manure? So the first, uh, first question there is uh, the, the wood chips um, and, and the sawdust as well. It really doesn't matter. I found I, the first time I did stropharia, I like went to a local mill and I bought, you know, fancy, uh, pure, um, dried uh, uh, white ash chips. You know, entirely homogenous, just one species. I had no luck doing stropharia in there. And since then, I've just gone to my local town pile of wood chips and gotten whatever mix is in there, and that's what's really worked the best. Um, what we usually recommend is that you try to aim for at least. Uh, over 50% of your wood chips are hardwoods because, again, those conifers can, can tend to have uh, resins that will inhibit mushroom growth. But there's, I don't actually know if I, I, I can completely agree with that recommendation because if you have older wood chips that have, starting to start, have started to break down, um, you're not having as much of an issue with some of those resins. A lot of those have, have left. So I, one time I got a pile of, by accident, a pile of cedar chips, like almost pure cedar, and I inoculated them with stropharia without really even thinking about it and realized later that the stropharia still did fine. It actually colonized quite well. So we really don't know. This is one of the reasons we're trying to do the research at Cornell. Um, as far as the second question, can the straw include chicken manure? I think it would be fine to include chicken manure. We've certainly done you know, composted straw on top. Um, as long as the, uh, the manure is, is well composted, I think you'd be fine. My only concern would be if the, the manure is rather fresh and, and still really hot. Uh, but I think it should be good. And then Chris asks if bees like shade. Um, again, we're doing trials to look at the difference between sort of uh, garden sun, what we call, you know, dappled sun with, with plants, 
maybe 50% shade and then 100% shade. And so I'll have those results, you know, in the next few years. Um, but what I would say pre preliminarily now is what we found in general is that um, the, the strophera tends to like maybe 50% to full sunlight in terms of its requirements. And what I found it to do best in, honestly, is underneath fruit trees and those mulch rings or in gardens um, where you have full sun exposure, but you have a little bit of shade being cast on the ground. Um, you'll, you can expect to see stropharia uh, show up um, anywhere from two months to, to a year after you've inoculated. Again, we have a wide range because we just don't have a lot of research on it. My best example was uh, we inoculated the orchard of a farm in, in western Massachusetts uh, where they had, um, they had sheep belly wool, actually. Uh, they sheared their sheep, and then they had all this belly wool, which is really knotty and kind of a mess, and you can't sell it or anything. So they actually would, would mulch their fruit trees with this belly wool. And uh, when, I, when I went to visit their farm, I said, well, we should try this as a mushroom substrate. So we, we essentially used that um, instead of the, uh, the sawdust. And, uh, and it worked great. We had mushrooms showing up in two months. So... You never know with these things, and, and it certainly takes an adventurous spirit to, to play with these mushrooms, and, and Stropharia is probably the best to be sort of playful with. All right, whoops, sorry about that. So just this last slide here, uh, just showing some of the Stropharia's I grew in my garden. This is a, uh, the bottom left here is a, a wood chip box um, that I grew, and you can see the mycelium just really taking off, doing really well. And this is actually growing in between uh, some tomatoes that we had in the garden here. Okay. So just a few resources. We're wrapping up here. Um, as I've mentioned, our, our Mushroom Growers Network website is mushrooms.cals.cornell.edu. And when you go to that website, you'll find a number of different things along the top here that are of interest. I particularly recommend the fact sheets page. Um, we have a nice 12-page uh, inoculation uh, guide for shiitake in particular. We have the totem fact sheet, which I mentioned is, is slightly out of date, but will be updated. Uh, we have events. So uh, we just had our, our annual camp mushroom at the Arnott Forest, which is where, which is where Peter works. Um, and we will be uh, doing several different uh, inoculation events at extension, cooperative extension offices around New York State. So you can check that out. We also have a growers listserv, so whether you're interested um, in, uh, oops, sorry, my screen just popped something else up, my computer, just a little there, okay. Um, a listserv is really good for either hobby or commercial growers to, uh, to talk about um, different forms of mushroom production. If you're looking for a, a book resource, um, Mycelium Running is probably one of the best and most up-to-date uh, books, and uh, it's by Paul Stamets, who I've mentioned a few times in this presentation. And I'll also just mention that um, Ken Mudge and I are working on a book called Farming the Woods, and it's a book about forest farming, and our website's farmingthewoods.com. That book's probably going to be out next spring, and there's a number of articles, uh, interviews, that sort of thing that might be interest uh, to this audience. So with that, uh, I'll leave up my contact here. You're welcome to contact me with more questions, and I'll stay on for a few minutes here, and we'll see if anyone else uh, has questions. Steve, this was outstanding. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it, and it looks like from the comments that people have as well. So um, I appreciate your pushing through your cold to offer this uh, webinar today. Steve will... He said we'll be here for a few minutes. If you all have questions, please feel free to, to jump in with those. For those of you who are uh, past participants, I'll be sending you a, uh, because I have all of your registration information, I'll send you all a direct link to the um, evaluation page so that we can grab your um, uh, gr grab your reactions through that evaluation. Um, I, I was, I've heard of Strafaria for years. I was intrigued by the notion of doing it in a variety of kind of, um, I don't know the right word, it's just kind of incidental, I'll call them incidental locations around the bases of fruit trees or I was asking about the sawdust because I have a, a portable band sawmill and I've been sawing a lot of two-year-old pine trees so they're quite dry and I'll be, I'll be interested in experimenting with some of that old it's it's not degraded, but it's old 
um, pine sawdust and see how that works uh, with some straw or something else. So, okay, are there? Let's see if there's any questions. Um, so, so sorry, there's a few about um, where we can get some of the spawn. Yes. Yep. Um, so I'll just mention that. Um, we're often working with. I mentioned Field and Forest products, and I'll, I'll put their website there in the in the chat box. Um, Field and Forest is 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 really one of the premier growers, and um, there's not a lot. You know, you think about the number of seed companies. There's very few spawn producers, and so there's Field and Forest, which is out in Wisconsin. There's Fungi Perfecti, which I mentioned is Paul Stamets' outfit in, in Northwest. And then the other one I'm familiar with is is Mushroom People, which is down in Tennessee. Um, there's probably a few others around, but you know, we often go with field and forest. One of the things I like about them is they have probably about 12 different strains of, of shiitake available. So you have all these different different weather conditions, different you know, some of them fruit with two mushrooms coming out of the same hole. I mean, all these funky things. So um, we definitely like to promote uh, to promote them. Although we really don't advocate particularly for one over the other. Um, all these growers are doing a really good job of, of producing high quality spawn. Um, so. You know, if you can find someone closer to home, that's actually the best, uh, because you're going to ha likely have isolates that are that are native to your local ecosystem. I just I saw that there were some questions about where the where people could go to see see some of this take place. And Lou Ward mentioned a mushroom workshop that's happening at the Arnott Forest on May 11th. I just posted a direct link to the events tab if people want more information. Uh, if you're in the central New York area, that'll be happening at the Arnott Forest with. Uh, Ken Mudge, and I suspect that you would, that's in the morning, I suspect you'd have a chance to see there's nearby, there's both the totem lane yard as well as the low A-frame lane yard, and then that afternoon there will be a forest health walk with George Hudler, a uh, forest pathologist. If you're, Steve, you, you're doing a workshop that day up in, you said Wayne County, Ontario County, on May 11th? Uh, actually, yeah, Wayne and... Orleans County that day. Orleans, okay. Are do you have are those posted on the on the Cornell Mushroom site as far as events if people are closer to those locations? Yeah, if you go to the mushrooms.cals.cornell and click on events, uh, we have all of our our classes listed there. Okay, let's see. Uh, Ron has a question there from Ron: twelve to fourteen inch diameter sugar maple. Yeah, so you can you can really use any any size diameter logs. Um, the trick is moving them around. If you think about soaking a three foot, fourteen inch diameter log, it's 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 a beast. So one option would be to cut them shorter. You could cut them to you know eighteen inches or something, um, and and that would probably be the best. But yeah, absolutely they'll work. The only other caveat I would say is that you might wait a little bit longer for that initial spawn run. Uh, before they're ready to fruit, because the, the mushrooms got to eat through the but certainly, uh, certainly usable for for shiitake. Is it safe to assume that those larger diameter logs would last longer? I mean, you're mentioning three to five years for the four to six inch bolts. Would the larger diameter last longer? Yeah, I think um, I think in general, it's it's safe to. To think that would work, and we never really know with these things. But I think, um, you know, usually those those tend to last a little bit longer once they're once they're established. Um, another option, this is sort of a, another level of production, but um, with those bigger diameter logs, you can you can purchase what are called cold weather strains. Cold weather strains of mushrooms of shiitake in particular, um, they don't fruit. They don't respond to soaking. And what you actually do is they, they fruit just like the other ones I mentioned in the fall and in the spring when the temperatures are kind of fluctuating. So you can inoculate those bigger diameter logs with those mushrooms and then just leave them out in your woods and they'll fruit when they're ready. And that, that's a nice um, nice companion. We're actually working with some of our growers to use the cold weathers as sort of a season extension kind of, uh, kind of model there. Okay. Walter's asking about experience with using ash for mushrooms. Yeah, we uh, camp mushroom last year at the Arnott. We inoculated entirely ash. Um, interested again in you know with emerald ash borer and doing some thinning if that was appropriate. Um, our we don't have the since we just did them last year we don't have the full results. 
I've done ash in the past, and I've gotten a few mushrooms pop out here and there, but certainly not the level of, of some of the other logs. Um, I'm trying to think. Hickory was also another log I tried that had similar. It was uh, just not as uh, prolific as I would hope. Um, but again, if you're a backyard hobby grower, you know, it may be fine uh, to not have as to maximize the yield. So, you know, again, use use whatever wood that is a, a byproduct of your forest forest plan there. Okay. Ron asks about how much shade is needed for shiitake. Um, I would recommend 60% um, would be sort of the lower end, uh, ideally even 100%. I mean, my logs are all in a sugar maple forest. Um, which is great shade uh, most of the year. This time of year, it's a little bit of a, a waiting game for that shade to come out. So I actually uh, put shade cloth over my logs uh, in the winter. Um, you know, ideally a thick hemlock stand or, or, or white pine is really is really ideal. Um, so so anywhere from 60% above should be should be good. So there's some site design that would go into finding that that physical proximity of shade and access to water and vehicle access and you know getting into uh, harvest and take product to market. Yeah. Yeah, it's always a mix. It's always a compromise. I mean, usually we've had a lot of growers who said, well, my best hemlocks are, you know, are, are in the back acreage of my woodlot, um, but I don't really, I can't really access them. And the other problem is, you know, once you're in production, you really have to be able to look at your logs almost every day. So sometimes you compromise for a less desirable forest type or you know, one of these other things so that you can have access. Um, obviously, clean water is another important thing. Figuring out a way to you know, pipe in water or, or haul it or something is, is key. Usually, you want to re refresh your water tank you know, at least once a month because it tends to get a little funky if you don't. So that's Certainly, a lane yard is, is a little bit of a design challenge to figure out the best the best scenario. So, Bill asks, which mushrooms are native to northeastern PA? Did you did you mention any that were not native to the northeastern PA? Um, the the lion's mane is. Some of the oysters are. Uh, Shiitake is not native to anywhere in the U.S. It's a it's a it's a Chinese, Japanese, Asian native. Um, so you'll never find shiitake out in the woods. You know, um, I think the best. You know, usually it's not so specific to northeastern Pennsylvania, but like the the Peterson's Guide uh, to Mushroom ID is probably one of the best bets in terms of learning your your local mushrooms. Um, so they're they're going to be similar for, throughout the Northeast and actually the East Coast even by and large. You know you may not find some of these mushrooms as you get further south or further north, but uh, they're all pretty similar. There's not nearly as many species to learn with those as some of the other plants or things out there. So. Right. I guess in terms of production, if if it wasn't re if the all of the all the mushrooms that you mentioned would probably grow in northeastern Pennsylvania, wouldn't they? Yeah. Even though if, if they're not native, they'd still grow there under production? Yeah, usually uh, the range for log grow mushrooms is 55 to, to 70 degrees in temperature. Um, they'll grow at, in hotter temperatures, um, but you have moisture challenges. So, you know, all of these mushrooms will grow um, in any temperate region, really all the way from the, you know, from Maine down into down into Georgia, um, and then into the Midwest and, and the West Coast as well. I mean. Uh, they're, they're pretty adaptable, which is nice. Um, and we've even branched out. We have a grad student who started doing oyster production in Rwanda this past year. Uh, mm. We've had uh, another farmer grower that's doing workshops in, in Jamaica. Um, and they're, they're inoculating shiitake on, I don't remember the species, but it's, it's something in the oak family. So, you know, e even in the uh, sort of wide wide span of the world, you know, we may not have red oak or white oak, but if we get the Quercus is a, the, the oak family is pretty common. There's a, there's a species on every continent. So that's usually where we start with shiitake uh, for overseas. Sure. Well, Steve, I want to thank you for your time today. I know you've, you've been battling with this cold. Um, I think we'll call this to an end. Um, I appreciate all of the participants and uh, again, I had I thought this was a great presentation, and I really appreciate your putting it together. And 
I'll look forward to making it available, and I'll send you the link so that you can also post it on your website. So with that, I'll call this to a close, and thank you all very much. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. So, Steve, I'll give you a call. We can chat about how you're feeling. Okay. All right. Thanks.